In this lecture, we're going to talk about therapy, both psychotherapy as well as biomedical therapies. We'll take a look at the different kinds within each category as well as some pros and cons for each type. So psychotherapy involves techniques that are employed to improve psychological functioning and promote adjustment to life. This can be used for uh, in a major intervention way for major psychological disorders or they could be used for general life improvement although most commonly they're used when somebody is uh, has been diagnosed with major depressive disorder generalized anxiety disorder borderline personality disorder kind of all the stuff that we talked about during the uh, the psych disorders lectures so let's cover some myths about therapy uh, there is one best therapy this is simply not true there is not one kind of therapy that works for everybody, for every disorder, uh, every background, uh, group, single, whatever. Um, we have several different kinds of therapy for a reason. People are just are, are just too diverse in order for one single type of therapy to exist to address all the various concerns that people can go through. Therapists can read your mind. Uh, this also obviously not true. Um, much of what we try to do in therapy is is to ask questions for clarification. We we need to we need to be able to see things from the client's perspective, and the only way to do so is to ask those questions. And when it comes to our interpretations of what somebody is saying, what they may be thinking, they're still just kind of suppositions and, and guesses of, of uh, educated guesses certainly, but they're still kind of little testable hypotheses that we try to uh, test through the use of therapy. If I'm thinking that somebody is actually upset at a coworker, but they don't seem to want to admit that, I may ask questions to kind of guide us along that track to get to that point. But again, if it really comes out that I was incorrect and that hypothesis was wrong and you're, you're genuinely upset perhaps at, uh, at your spouse, then that's, I was wrong I, I, because I cannot read your mind. Uh, people who go to therapists are crazy or weak. Again, absolutely not true. Uh, plenty of people from all different kinds of backgrounds go to therapists for various different reasons. Uh, it does not take a crazy person to uh, uh, seek therapy. Anybody can benefit from it uh, so long as the relationship is, is strong and that there's a great therapeutic alliance between the client and the clinician. Only the rich can afford therapy. No, we, there exists several different levels of care between uh, outpatient therapy, community mental health centers, hospitals, and so on, and many of them offer different rates of, uh, of, of charging rates for what it takes to see uh, a therapist. Uh, many people, many therapists see clients pro bono, uh, so without any cost whatsoever, and uh, others have sliding scales to meet the, the uh, financial needs of the client involved. So again, uh, this is not just a, a rich person's uh, method of treatment. And lastly, if I'm taking meds, I don't need therapy. Also completely untrue. The meds generally, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, are kind of the uh, an excellent band-aid, a very, very excellent band-aid, uh, to kind of get you through the moment and get you through to uh, through uh, the, the more difficult stuff that's going on, but the therapy will help create more long-lasting effects. Um, in, in the long run. So uh, just some things to consider. A lot of people have uh, different beliefs about therapy and hopefully I'll be able to help debunk some of these with some examples as we go through the lecture. So there are three major approaches to therapy. We have insight therapy, behavioral therapy, and then biomedical therapy. And in, insight, uh, in the insight style of therapy we have psychoanalysis, also known as psychodynamic in more modern times, we have uh, cognitive forms of therapy like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as REBT, rational mode of behavior therapy. Uh, humanistic, this is uh, the one that I personally adhere to, client-centered therapy from Rogers. And uh, then there's group, family, and marital therapy. Behavioral therapy m involves more conditioning. If you recall the, uh, the learning lecture in this course, that all falls under the behavioral method of therapy, using classical and operant conditioning to try to change the person's reactions to different stimuli. And lastly, observational learning also falls within behavioral therapy. In biomedical therapy, we have different options as well with uh, psychopharmacology, electroconvulsive therapy, which is different than you may, may have seen in, in movies, and uh, psychosurgery. So let's take a look at insight therapies. 
Insight therapies are a variety of therapies seeking to improve psychological functioning by increasing awareness of underlying motives and improvement in thoughts, feelings, and or behavior. Again, different types. Psychoanalysis was kind of the, the older form, although it's still used today, developed by Freud. Uh, psychodynamic therapies, uh, cognitive therapy, humanistic, and so on, group family marital. So let's take a look at psychoanalysis. This is a Freudian therapy designed to bring unconscious conflicts into conscious awareness, that there exists these issues underneath your conscious awareness that you, that you are not aware of, and if we can analyze what you're saying and how you're behaving and what, you're, what you may be thinking, we can make some sense of it and find out what is really bothering you underneath. Bring that into conscious awareness, and then we can actually grapple with them and do something about uh, changing who we are, changing our, our outlook on the world, and what uh, and how we interact with it. Some major criticisms of Freudian therapy, the, the psychoanalysis form, is that it's limited in applicability, uh, doesn't seem to be uh, useful, again, across a wide domain of, of psychological disorders, and there's a bit of a lack of scientific credibility. It, uh, it's, it sounds great, and it looks great on paper, but empirically speaking, it's just not as strong as some other forms of therapy, although I'll address this again a little bit later. Uh, there's just a little bit uh, that comes into question regarding its credibility. Modern psychodynamic therapy, though, kind of the, the therapists of today who, uh, who have borrowed Freud's techniques and, and expanded upon them and improved them, uh, they use this, this form of therapy. It's a briefer, more directive, and more modern form of psychoanalysis that focuses more on conscious processes and current problems. So there isn't this, this necessarily uh, rich focus on everything that we cannot see. There isn't a huge focus on the unseen. Instead, it's, it's more about what are you doing, what are you aware of now, and how can we make that difference in our day-to-day -day lives. Cognitive therapies uh, the first co uh, basic cognitive therapy in general, it's a therapy that, that treats problem behaviors and mental processes by focusing on faulty thought processes and beliefs. Essentially, cognitive therapies tackle issues by examining this kind of faulty pattern of thinking and, and the way that you understand the world. And, and this will make sense in just a moment when we look at some, um, uh, some flowcharts and whatnot, um, that we have... A, a difficult time understanding the way the world really is because of our own kind of filter that we put in like over our thinking and how we understand it and through that faulty thinking then we start to behave uh, uh, erratically and, and have uh, psychological disorders uh, begin to, to show their ugly heads. Uh, important concept here, uh, a term here, self-talk. This is internal dialogue, the things that people say to themselves when they interpret events. I just alluded to regarding uh, how people interpret things and, and how they kind of try to make sense of them, how they describe it, describe the, the event to themselves, again, in that effort to explain it. Cognitive restructuring is the process in cognitive therapy to change destructive thoughts or inappropriate interpretations. That when somebody views uh, a stressful event as being their fault and because they're a bad person, cognitive restructuring would seek to change that that thinking pattern that you are not a bad person and that it may not have been entirely your fault it's taking a more kind of logical and step back approach like let's let's zoom out and look at things and see if we can make a little bit more sense of them without kind of owning all of this uh, this guilt and and uh, sadness and everything for for your role in the event and cognitive behavioral therapy combines cognitive therapy, kind of changing the faulty thinking, with behavioral therapy, changing faulty behaviors. The idea here is that if we can change the way that you think about the world and, and, and the events that occur within it, and we can uh, use some, some techniques involved in uh, classical and operant conditioning, that we can change, if we change your thinking and your behaviors, that naturally your feelings will change as well, and uh, we will see the change within the person in their day-to-day -day lives. So let's take a look at cognitive restructuring. Somebody who lost an important sales account and, and the differences between uh, uh, how they view themselves and the world. So internal, using internal self-talk and beliefs, we would see that somebody with depression may say, well, I hate sales. I just hate doing this as, as a, you know, for a living. Or I'm a shy person and I'll never be good at this. 
I have to find another job before they fire me. Well, let's take a look at the I'm a shy person one right there in the middle. So somebody who says, I'm a shy person, and I'll never be good at this, immediately limits themselves and their ability to ever perform well in this job. Because if that's true, that they are just naturally a shy person, and that is not good for that job, and they'll never be good at that, what hope do they have to ever perform well? You, you know, when they go to look for the success, they're simply not going to see it. And that repeated pattern of thinking and, and faulty reasoning leads to decreased efforts, low energy, and depression. The person just attributes all of the, the bad things that occur on their job to themselves as a person and not necessarily just the, the nature of, of it being a challenging job or a difficult situation or, or what have you. Um, so somebody with a more uh, realistic outlook would say, selling can be difficult, but hard work pays off. If I just work harder, if I stick with it, maybe ask for some help, seek guidance, I can do something about this. I can make change. Or I'm shy, but people respect my honesty and low-key approach. So maybe that person is shy in sales, and that makes them stand out. Like at least, at least makes them a bit different among their coworkers, and perhaps people like kind of having that low-key approach, and that that may actually be a trait that they can use to their benefit. And lastly, I had the account before, and I'll get it back. So if you can think on the successes you've had in the past as being evidence that you can be successful, then logically you would lead to you would be led to a point of understanding that it may be possible for you to become successful again in the future. So this person we would see increased efforts, increased energy, and no depression. Again, the difference between how we attribute successes and failures to ourselves or the situation can really lead to uh, 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 some pretty major issues or some, uh, some great potential for success depending on how, how much that pattern recurs over time. Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. This is a cognitive therapy to eliminate emotional problems through rational examination of irrational beliefs. Albert Ellis coined this term masturbation. He talks a lot about must and shoulds, about how much people have these beliefs of, of I must be like this, I should do this, that I must be the perfect parent, I should be a better brother, I, I should have been, uh, been more reliable at work, I must be, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, the perfect student. Uh, when people get caught up on these musts and shoulds, it's very black and white thinking. And that's not really how the world works. It's not how the world really exists. It doesn't exist in a black and white, yes or no kind of, uh, kind of way, especially with people. So if we can kind of break out of that black and white thinking of musts and shoulds, again, this kind of masturbation, uh, then we can find more realistic success and kind of realistic efforts to achieve uh, goals rather than just saying, well, what's the use? I failed twice before. That means that I will inevitably fail, you know, countless times in the future. So here's an example. So somebody receives a poor performance evaluation. That's the activating event. We have a, uh, the alphabet here, A, B, C, and D, to kind of uh, show all the different stages for REBT. So there's the activating event. The individual is blocked from that desired goal. This is the experience that leads that, that could lead to trouble, that could lead to problematic thinking. And in this case, it does. It, it leads to irrational beliefs, uh, the, the B form. I always mess up. The individual interprets the frustration in an irrational and erroneous manner, that it's inaccurate to think, I always mess up, that black and white thinking, always indicating that there has never once been a time where you've been successful. To think that I've always messed up at this is an irrational belief for most people, the vast majority of people, in, uh, uh, in any kind of profession uh, where they receive perhaps their first poor performance evaluation. But this irrational belief leads to emotional consequences. The individual experiences negative feelings which reinforce the original irrational beliefs, thinking I'm depressed, I'm sad, and I'm sad because I always mess up. Again, it comes back to that irrational belief of uh, perhaps thinking, I'm just a depressed person, there's something wrong with me, I'm always down and it's, it's having an impact on my work, but that's just who I am, perhaps. Um, so what, what REBT would do is try to dispute the irrational beliefs, change it into, uh, for, instead of being I always mess up, to I can do well, I just need to work harder, or I just need to work differently. The individual challenges irrational beliefs, 
which changes the negative emotions. We, we uh, intercept that irrational belief and kind of kick it out and say, no, let's look at kind of more of a gray way of thinking, of saying, well, it's possible for me to do well. Is it at least possible? So let's see what we can do to try to reach that success, even if at first it feels highly unlikely. What can we do to kind of grapple with that struggle instead of just resorting simply to, I always mess up, that's going to be the downfall of my job, I'm going to get fired, I feel sad, I'm such a bad person. It just keeps snowballing in that way. We need to intercept that and intervene at that point to, to change the person's irrational beliefs. Again, a primary goal of REBT is to overcome irrational misconceptions. The person, the, the client needs to identify and confront their belief system, evaluate the consequences, and then practice more effective ways of thinking and behaving. And that's REBT, Rational Mode of Behavior Therapy, in a nutshell. Beck's Cognitive Therapy, on the other hand, uh, looks at something very similar and, and uses similar methods to overcome them, but, but still kind of different. Uh, regarding distorted thinking patterns, Beck explained that, that there's this kind of selective perception that people who are depressed or who, uh, who get kind of caught into that, uh, that depression, they focus on negative events. They often tend to overgeneralize things as well, say that this one event must therefore apply to a wide variety of other events that maybe only share very few similarities, uh, thinking that if I lost, we go back to the idea of losing the sales account. If I lose that sales account, I'm going to lose all the sales accounts. That's a, a very depressing overgeneralization. Uh, again, this leads to magnification that uh, that it exagger the person may exaggerate undesirables and shortcomings and saying, this is the clear indication that things are only going to get worse and I'm going to fail and something terrible is going to happen. And lastly, all or nothing thinking, uh, another distorted thinking pattern, seeing things in black or, or white. A person must recognize and track these thoughts and then test these thoughts against reality. That if that's the way you feel, if that's really the way it is, write it down and then see, use it as a testable hypothesis and see how often is it true and how often is it false. If it's ever false at all, if your belief that I can not maintain any sales accounts at all, there's no way that I'll ever get an A again. If you ever get a single A again, if you ever get another sales account or what have you, that immediately just blows everything out of the water and and really starts to break down that distorted thinking pattern and that's what we try to look for in uh, in cognitive therapy is trying to see what what we could do with with uh, a person's thinking patterns to try to get them back on track uh, and within a, a more realistic realm so cognitive therapies are really effective for people with depression anxiety disorders bulimia and over nervosa uh, anger management, addiction, procrastination, some forms of schizophrenia, and insomnia. It's really uh, great for a wide variety of, of issues. Um, however, it does ignore unconscious processes. It's very literal, very straightforward, that if you don't see it, it doesn't exist, essentially. Um, if the person isn't reporting the thought, they're probably not thinking it. Uh, this is kind of a criticism because there's still a, a strong value in the clinical psychology community that, in general, that there's likely a little bit more to us than meets the eye, that there's something a, a little bit more going on underneath, and cognitive therapies typically ignore that. There's also an over overemphasis on, on rationality of, of how do you get to a point of determining whether something is rational or not. Uh, I kind of liken it to using a ruler to measure itself, that if you look at a ruler and it says 12 inches, it's going to be 12 inches if you believe it. Uh, that when you use your own mind to try to determine whether something is rational or not, it can be kind of troubling. Uh, it can be a little bit difficult to think, well, if my therapist says it's, this is a rational way of thinking, how do I really know that? I mean, it's, you know, they bring over a ruler that says 12 inches and it happens to be longer. This whole time I'm looking at mine and, and it's shorter and I'm thinking, but I don't know, do I want to believe him? Is, so he says that his is accurate. How do I, how do I even know that? Uh, it minimizes the importance of the past as well. It's very much about the here and now and what's going on in this moment uh, and, and looking for that evidence to kind of counteract your irrational beliefs as, as you're experiencing them. And it often uses behavior techniques rather than changing the cognitive structure. So as much as there's a, an emphasis on thinking patterns and, and, and uh, uh, cognitive therapy, you know, just in the name even, um, that there 
is, is still a strong emphasis on changing the way a person acts and behaves in their environment to lead to that cognitive change. So it's really not as balanced as it, as it necessarily sounds. Although overall, again, great form of therapy. But for the purpose of this class, we really got to cover the pros and cons of, of everything. Humanistic therapies. This is a therapy that focuses on removing obstacles that block personal growth and potential. Rogers, Carl Rogers uh, uh, devised this form of client-centered therapy that emphasizes the client's natural tendency to become healthy and productive. That a, a, uh, a person naturally wants to be successful, naturally wants to be doing well in life, and that just like in, with anybody, there's going to be an obstacle that comes, in, that comes up and kind of makes us stumble or fall. If you recall from uh, Batman Begins, that when Bruce Wayne falls and his, his uh, father asks, you know, why do we fall down so we could pick ourselves back up? Uh, this is it's a very kind of Rogerian way of thinking that when we encounter an obstacle, many times we're going to pick ourselves back up, but sometimes we don't. And these, these obstacles then, they just keep us down. These hurdles become insurmountable, at least they feel like it, and it's difficult for us to achieve any of the goals that we've set for ourselves. And, and Rogers really emphasized the importance of calling people clients who are seeking him for treatment and not patients. Because ultimately, it's the client who's in charge. It's the client who's enlisted the therapist for their help. That when I go to a mechanic, I'm asking for their expertise and I'm, and I'm, I'm hoping that they'll fix my car, but I'm still paying them. I'm giving them the, my earned wages to, uh, to, to help for them to help me in my difficult situation. And that doesn't mean that there's anything broken with me. It's just, you know, like the, the name patient or the word patient kind of connotes that there's nothing wrong with me just because I can't fix my car. Uh, that's just a different skill set that I, that somebody else possesses and I don't. This is what Rogers, uh, his way of thinking in, in terms of calling people who seek treatment from him clients that they are just hiring him because he has a different skill set than they do and they want some help with with something there's nothing broken with somebody who has depression or anxiety or any other issues in client-centered therapy there are these therapeutic qualities of communication that rogers emphasize empathy is huge it's this insightful awareness and ability to share another's inner experience it's this way to relate to another person, to kind of walk a mile in their shoes and understand how they got to feeling the way they did in that situation. Kind of getting to that point of, yeah, I can imagine that if, you ha if I had experienced the same thing, I would be angry too. I would be sad too. That's empathy. Unconditional positive regard. If you recall this from the personality section, this is the love and acceptance with no contingencies piece. That regardless of who you are or your background or what you do, I just know that you're a good person and I accept you for who you are and I think that you can be successful just like anybody else. There just happens to be an obstacle in the way and let's see if we can help you overcome that obstacle yourself. There's also an important piece of genuineness and authenticity that the, the therapist is him or herself and not this kind of like lofty doctor person of I know more than you and I'm and I need to maintain this this kind of uh, uh, stale uh, you know kind of a persona I with with uh, Rogerian uh, kind of therapy it's really just being yourself it's it's saying what you think and saying what you feel as a therapist in the moment to the client and that's a very important piece for the client to understand that he or she is working with a person too that they are not working with a sounding board or this or like a parental figure or anything like that that it's two people coming together with different skill sets one trying to learn from the other and lastly active listening that involves reflecting paraphrasing and clarifying that I'm not just sitting there writing notes quietly, I'm actually listening to you, that I'm going to be paraphrasing what you're saying, clarifying, trying to figure out a way to understand your perspective. I can't have empathy if I don't know, if I'm not active listening, if I'm not, if I don't know what you're going through or, or what you're thinking. So some support for the humanistic therapies is that the evidence for the efficacy of it is, is very good. Uh, it's, uh, it's generally a, a, a a, a moderately researched uh, technique or, or kind of realm of therapy 
and uh, the, the support is really is, is fairly strong. However, it, its core concepts and criticisms are difficult to empirically test. It's kind of hard to test empathy and unconditional positive regard and uh, active listening and, and whatnot, and, and this idea that we are all naturally su successful beings or, or you know seeking success. Um, so it's kind of hard to test. Um, some data on the outcomes rely on the self-reports of clients. If the only way that we can know if humanistic therapies work is if the clients say so. And how much of that is going to be tainted by the uh, inexperience, you know, sour experience with the therapist or the client kind of walking away feeling like, well, they didn't give me much homework. Homework is, is very much a hallmark of cognitive style therapies and not necessarily humanistic. So somebody leaves and says, well, the, my therapist doesn't tell me what to do or doesn't give me suggestions of things to try at home. Um, that can lead to clients kind of feeling like, I don't know what's going on. And lastly, there's mixed results on specific therapeutic techniques. Some techniques that have been developed by Rogers have, uh, have been kind of difficult to replicate across different therapists. And, and es essentially, it seemed like Rogers was a great Rogerian therapist, and that sometimes it's a little difficult for everyone to be a great Rogerian therapist, regardless of the level of training they've received. Now regarding group, family, and marital therapies. Group therapy is when a number of people meet together to work toward therapeutic goals, and they're guided by a therapist. There's actually an interesting video of Carl Rogers um, using his techniques within a, a group therapy format from many decades ago. Uh, I'll put the, the link up on Reddit for, uh, uh, for those of you who are curious to watch. Um, but uh, many group therapists use kind of a humanistic approach. Uh, or an existential approach kind of fall into a, a similar realm, although there there are plenty of groups that are like social skills groups that are more cognitive or behaviorally based. Uh, there are plenty of, uh, of anxiety groups and, and um, OCD support groups and, and whatnot. Uh, it can really take on any number of, of uh, formats, but a therapist ultimately kind of guides the group of people. It could be four, six, eight, ten, twelve people in a group, uh, usually not too big, um, all working toward that kind of therapeutic goal, whether it's a goal as a group of people or a goal with each individual. A self-help group is, is a leaderless or non-professionally guided group where members assist one another with a specific problem. So this is like Alcoholics Anonymous and, and groups similar to that where uh, different people may take on a leadership position or there may be kind of a leader but they're still not viewed necessarily as like a as a leader uh, they're more they're still kind of just another person who's a part of the group uh, so uh, ultimately it's about the person helping themselves and just kind of participating at their own rate and and uh, you know perhaps not even participating at all some advantages of group therapy it's usually less expensive because uh, you're you could have maybe eight or ten people sharing the cost of that therapist's billable hour. Um, so in some cases, it may be as little as you know five or ten bucks, or maybe you know twenty, thirty bucks a person. Uh, sometimes even more. But when you consider what one hour of individual therapy may cost, this is significantly less expensive. You also get uh, group support. You get uh, other people who you get to know and and get to uh, interact with and and get close with, who will be there and you can count on to support you in your efforts. That when a client says to a therapist, I feel like sometimes uh, I, um, I get angry at my spouse and I don't know what to do about that. Uh, like I, I'm, I worry I may want to hit them. Um, a therapist who's maybe not been in that situation or has, but, but still, you know, hasn't really been in that kind of a heated moment, uh, is just going to do their best to try to empathize with somebody. In a group format, perhaps for people who have perpetrated domestic violence or who uh, are in you know, kind of rocky relationships, you're going to be in a group of people who've all been there. They've been in that moment just like you, and they struggle with that on a regular basis. And that's really empowering to feel like I'm not alone in experiencing this. This isn't something unique or broken about me. There, you also develop a, a great deal of insight and gain information from sharing your stories with other people and to listening to other stories of, of people who've been, who've been there. Just when you think you're in your darkest place, the person next to you shares a story that sounds e perhaps even worse, and you think, oh man, I'm not even at that point, and, and it really puts things into perspective of, uh, of how, how bad things may be going on in my life.
And lastly, there can be an opportunity for behavior rehearsal. It gives you a chance to kind of role play and to participate in group activities with others and, and to try things out. If you're learning about new ways to handle an argument with somebody, you've got a room full of people to try it out on from various backgrounds to see how well might it work in an unpredictable, realistic scenario, as opposed to kind of a, a structured, kind of predictable scenario with just you and a therapist. And lastly, it can be a great supplement to individual therapy. Uh, not a lot of people seek both, but uh, it can still work really well where you get to kind of process through your, in, your experiences and, as an individual with your individual therapist and then kind of uh, regroup and come back to the group and try to uh, act things out and, and, and try things out and listen to others and, and you know, utilize what's being worked on in that group setting. Family and marital therapies, the goal here is to change maladaptive family interaction patterns. It's most useful for treatment of marital infidelity, anger management, adolescent drug abuse, and schizophrenia. Now, when there's something major disrupting the, the family dynamic, like infidelity and, and uh, violence and whatnot, uh, that, that marital and family therapy is, is a wonderful, very effective approach to address such major concerns. There can also be some like general uh, uh, kind of counseling skills that, that people uh, could be good to, uh, to, to develop to kind of make them a little bit more effective in day-to-day in, um, -day lives with, with others. Uh, active listening, we can all learn to listen a little bit better, I think, maintaining better eye contact, uh, in, in, uh, paraphrasing and summarizing and reflecting on what somebody else is saying not just nodding your head quietly, that's more passive listening. Active listening is, is you actually kind of speaking and saying things to show that you're listening. Um, and these can be ways to kind of uh, to help others um, uh, you know, if somebody comes to you in a time of need and they need help, you know, they, need to, uh, they need someone to listen to them. Um, using active listening skills can really help in that situation. Also acceptance. You go back to kind of a Rogerian way of thinking that accepting people for who they are and not thinking that they're a bad person because of the behaviors that they've chosen to do uh, can really go a long way to changing the attitude that, that you hold about others and how they pick up on the attitude that you hold about them. And lastly, avoid, avoid giving advice that by telling somebody what to do or offering advice takes some of the responsibility away from the person to owning up to their, their the steps that they take because... If, it, if it's successful, they don't get to feel good about making that choice themselves. And if they fail, it's all on you. If they didn't you know, have, a, have a, a favorable experience taking your advice, you're going to get in trouble for it. As therapists, this is something that we do our best to avoid doing, is, is we try, as much as people think, oh, I go to a therapist to get advice, that's usually not the best course of action for a therapist. Uh, we, we try to help the person kind of discover their own options and discover the best path that they should take, decide that, decide that path themselves, and then kind of learn firsthand, did it work or didn't it work? Let's cover some of the behavioral therapies. So behavioral therapies, they're, they're a group of techniques based on learning principles that are used to change maladaptive behaviors. Again, coming back to the learning section a bit. The, if they focus on problem behaviors rather than underlying causes, and they rely on things like classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. Systematic desensitization is a, a form of behavioral therapy under the classical conditioning uh, kind of umbrella. Uh, it's a gradual process of extinguishing a learned fear or phobia by working through a hierarchy of fear-evoking stimuli while staying deeply relaxed. They essentially you replace the anxiety with relaxation. Aversion therapy, on the other hand, is pairing an aversive and unpleasant stimulus with a maladaptive, a, a maladaptive behavior. Essentially, you learn more about negative associations. Let's take a look at uh, systematic desensitization real quick. So, perhaps somebody who's scared of driving a car. They may, they may have a phobia of, uh, of, of hurting somebody while they're driving a car. They may think, oh, I may drive over a bump, and that what if that was a person? What if I hit a kid? Uh, you know, I live near a school, and there's kids running everywhere, and a quick glance down at my phone or a quick glance down at the radio or my speedometer or anything could result in me taking the life of another person. Something to be, you know, would, would be upsetting if that were the case. But to somebody who's never hit a child before, and, and really they experience the risks just the same as anyone else, that's, that's a maladaptive uh, way of thinking about the world. So what we would do first 
is have kind of uh, the least invasive, the least uh, stressful par uh, experience of driving a car. First, sitting behind the wheel of a, of a non-moving car in the driveway. So step one may be, let's go sit in a car. We're not going to turn on, we're not going to do anything, we're just going to sit, and that's it. Step two, drive along an empty, quiet street on a sunny day. You, you have somebody maybe go with you and take the car out to a, a farm road or something where you know you're not going to see anything, you can see for miles around, and uh, no, nobody's going to come out and you know jump out in front of the car. It's a clear sunny day, and you can just drive slowly for a little bit. Next up, let's kind of kick up the anxiety a little bit. Let's drive along a busy street on a sunny day. So let's actually get into the city, drive around other cars and other people and stuff, and see what that's like. Next up, let's drive on the same street in the rain. And then we'll keep, again, keep going up, keep going up. Drive on the same street at night. Drive on a busy expressway during the daytime. And then drive on a busy expressway on a rainy night. So somebody who's scared of driving, driving their car for whatever reason, we would start out with a little bit of desensitization with just sitting in a, in a parked car and then gradually with different experiences keep cranking it up, cranking it up over several sessions, over several months to eventually having the person driving on a busy expressway on a rainy night. Something that's very difficult and very stressful for anybody. But, we, but to move a person to that point will alleviate the stress of everything, of six, five, four, three, two, and one of everything before it. By the time you reach seven, you can handle anything else that, that occurs before. Aversion therapy before the conditioning. Uh, we have this uh, nausea-producing drug that we would never want to take ourselves uh, that would lead to nausea. Very aversive. I, you know, I don't like taking things that make me want to vomit. Uh, during the conditioning, we would add that to an alcoholic drink. And as we go to drink, then we start to feel sick because that drug is making us feel sick. And lastly, after conditioning, we wouldn't even put the, the drug in the drink in the first place because we've paired it enough to where the person thinks, man, every time I taste that wine, it just makes me want to vomit. There's no drug in there, but through conditioning, we've gotten to the point of, of a person just becoming sick even thinking about drinking. And so that's aversion therapy, getting to a point of, of being sick about something, as just as one example, uh, about something that you once enjoyed, and uh, then moving to a point of saying, I can't even have that anymore. Opera conditioning increases desired behaviors through reinforcement and shaping, and may use kind of a token system that when you do A, B, or C, you get a little you know green token or or a, a you know silver token or what have you. It may use some punishment and extinction to eliminate undesired behavior, and there are often opportunities for role playing and behavior rehearsal of kind of trying things out and seeing what it's like. That if I kind of learn through experience and try it over and over and over again, give myself like a little token or, or a teacher does or a therapist or somebody gives me something as, as like good job, recognition that you were able to behave appropriately, then you're going to feel good every time. You're going to want to seek that, that positive interaction every time you're presented with the opportunity. Lastly, observational learning. Uh, modeling therapy is essentially is what it is. It's watching and imitating models that demonstrate desirable behaviors. It's useful for treating phobias and training and social skills and assertiveness. That in, in for example, a social skills group, what we might do is have, uh, if we know that we have 10 kids and uh, who all have social skill issues, um, that we may kind of get an idea of, of which kids have major issues and which are kind of minor. So we may start by getting one of the kids who have kind of like minor issues and interacting with a therapist in a certain way, saying let's look eye to eye, shake hands and smile and converse for a while. I want you to, re to recall back what I said so I know you're listening and, and so on and so forth. And then all the while the, the kids who have major issues are watching and they're going to be watching the kid because they're just like them and saying, Oh, well, you know, if, if uh, little Jimmy can do that, maybe I could try it too. Maybe we'll pair the kids together too, so they're kind of learning from one another, seeing, yeah, this is kind of hard to maintain eye contact with somebody. And so that's observational learning, kind of watching other people behave in the si similar situation that you're going to and, and seeing how they are reacting to kind of the unknowns of, of any given social situation. So evaluating behavioral therapies, Great, great, great for use in phobias, OCD, eating disorders, uh, autism, intellectual disabilities, and, and uh, delinquency. Some, some kind of criticisms, though, 
uh, the generalizability to the real world is is a little tough. It's it's easy to 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 have it look good and sound good to have the, the clients behaving the way that they should be. If, you know, I hate to use that word given uh, what Ellis says about shoulds and musts. But uh, uh, if we have a, a system involved with uh, with delinquent teenagers and they're perhaps living in a in a treatment facility they get to a point using this these uh, behavioral therapies and and it looks like they're doing great they listen to their teachers they listen to each other they intervene with one another but then as soon as they get out into that real world it's really tough to generalize your experiences because you don't have that support of all of your colleagues and friends and and models who are kind of helping you through it and there lastly there are some ethics concerns related to control that uh, when we look at behavioral therapies and we're trying to to manipulate the behaviors of other people, that seems like that we that as therapists are being pretty controlling of somebody. And to what degree do we control a person's environment and and behaviors in the name of treatment and in the name of mental health and and improvement and whatnot? Um, so some it's it's not completely unethical, but. Uh, certainly it's just some uh, cause for concern and, and questioning uh, with regard to the behavioral therapies. Let's take a look at the biomedical therapies. So biomedical therapies use a biological intervention to treat psychological disorders. And this includes drugs, electroconvulsive therapy, and psychosurgery. And it's based on the premise that chemical imbalances or disturbed nervous system functions are involved in mental health problems, that there's something about our biology, about our body and, and our brain and, and the neurons and everything that are are uh, leading to disturbed behaviors and disturbed thoughts and, and mental illness. So psychopharmacology is the study of drug effects on brain and behavior. There are four major categories in psychopharmacology. There's anti-anxiety, antipsychotic, mood stabilizer, and antidepressant. So anti-anxiety drugs they lower the uh, sympathetic activity of the brain, the crisis mode of operation, so that the anxious responses are diminished or prevented and are replaced by feelings of tranquility and calmness. They try to, to reduce that anxiety, that kind of uh, 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 you know major kind of irritable feeling, and just try to, to soothe all that out so the person feels calm. Some examples, and these are the trade names, the uh, like the brand names of the drugs, are Ativan, um, uh, Halcyon, Librium, Restoril, Valium, Xanax. Antipsychotic drugs or neuroleptics are used to treat schizophrenia and other acute psychotic states, basically when a person is experiencing a delusion or a hallucination. Unfortunately, these drugs are often referred to as major tranquilizers, creating the mistaken impression that they are invari that they invariably have a strong sedating effect. The main effect of antipsychotic drugs is to diminish or eliminate psychotic symptoms, including hallucinations, delusions, withdrawal, and apathy. Traditional antipsychotics work by decreasing activity at the dopamine receptors in the brain. A large majority of patients show marked improvement when treated with antipsychotic drugs. They're great, they work very well, but they, they lead to a person being kind of zombified, uh, kind of shuffling around and... and uh, um, uh, you know, having slurred speech or, or uh, you know, just kind of leveling everything out to a major, major degree, at least if, if they're used uh, to in um, relatively high dosages. Um, but again, it all kind of depends on what the, uh, the symptoms are in the first place. Uh, so some common trade names, Hal uh, Haldol, uh, Prolixin, uh, Seroquel, Risperdal, Thorazine are, are some of the most popular ones. Mood stabilizers like lithium can be uh, can help relieve manic episodes and depression for people suffering from bipolar disorder, because lithium acts relatively slowly. It takes about three to four weeks uh, for it to to take its effect. Its primary use is in preventing future episodes and helping to break the manic depressive cycle. So it's not something that you would take right now because you're feeling manic, but rather it's something you would take all the time. You would take every day in in an effort to prevent this high spike from ever occurring. And Tegretol is, is a, a major drug, probably the one of the most popular ones. And lastly, antidepressant drugs are used to primarily treat people with, what else? Depression. They, uh, there are five types of antidepressant drugs. Uh, tricyclics, uh, MAOIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, in, um, inhibitors, SSRIs, and serotonin and 
uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, it should say uh, norepinephrine, not noepinephrine, um, SNRIs, and atypical antidepressants. Each class of drugs affects neurochemical pathways in the brain in slightly different ways, increasing or decreasing the availability of certain chemicals. SSRIs, like Paxil or Prozac, are by far the most commonly prescribed antidepressants. The atypical ones are a miscellaneous group of drugs used for patients who fail to respond to the other drugs or for people who experience side effects common to the other antidepressants. And, you know, huge uh, list of, uh, of drugs here. Um, Celexa, Effexor, uh, Paxil, Prozac, Wellbutrin, Zoloft. Um, and it should be noted that when it comes to the atypical antidepressants, as, as this uh, chart mentions, that they're usually used if people don't respond well to the uh, more common antidepressants. And when it comes to, to drugs in general, they all behave in any number of ways. They all act in different ways on people and will produce, uh, you know, sometimes severe side effects, sometimes no side effects at all. Uh, you know, uh, and of course a wide variety of side effects. But along with the side effects will come the, uh, uh, the potential for treatment and for relief of depression. And so it may be that somebody will take uh, an antidepressant and have experience side effects but not experience a, any treatment effect. No matter how long they stick with it, they, they, they follow the, the, um, um, the rules, the indications rather, the, um, as set forth by the prescribing provider. Even if they take, you know, if it says take the pill twice a day, every day, uh, they may be doing that, but they may never get to a point of, of feeling that relief. And so a, a, a psychiatrist or a prescribing uh, physician and whatnot will uh, start looking at other options and try to find other drugs because ultimately the, the goal here again is to relieve um, symptoms. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is a biomedical therapy based on passing electrical current through the brain. It is used almost exclusively to treat serious depression when drug therapy fails, and it likely affects mood-controlling neurotransmitters. Now, uh, again, as, as this is still kind of a scary picture, but uh, in general, this isn't like the kind of stuff that you would see from, from movies that shows people getting strapped down all over the place and just, you know, flailing their limbs and bouncing all over the, the, the gurney and uh, um, having this, this crazy shock going through their body. It's really very minor, and in, in many cases, people don't report feeling it at all, or they feel it uh, very, very weakly. It's, it's really more of the experience of having, um, uh, kind of shocking the brain in such a way that it uh, uh, kind of like rewires it and, and changes its, its, um, the way that it, it uh, transmits the signals within itself. And psychosurgery, this is surgical alteration of the brain to bring about desirable behavior uh, behavioral, cognitive, or emotional changes. It's generally used when patients have not responded to other forms of treatment. It can kind of a last resort thing. Um, and a lobotomy specifically uh, is an, an outmoded medical procedure for mental disorders that involve cutting nerve pathways between the frontal lobes and the thalamus or the uh, hypothalamus. That when we remove specific uh, nerve pathways that we find a great deal of symptom relief. But again, psychosurgery in general for psychological disorders is extremely rare, very much a last resort after therapy and bio other uh, biomedical like psychopharmacology methods have been utilized with uh, little to no success. So evaluating the biomedical therapies, psychopharmacology uh, provides a relief but not necessarily a cure and uh, can lead to physical dependence of, you know, I always feel good when I'm on this, my problems seem to go away, so I'll just stick with it forever. Uh, there's just something that doesn't sit right with, uh, you know, with a lot of people thinking, I'll just take this med for the rest of my life to change my brain, or to change the way my brain is, is behaving. Uh, there could be side effects and long-term effects as well to taking these drugs for a long time. And tardodyskinesia is a movement disorder that involves facial muscles their tongue, the limbs, and possible side effects. Uh, it, it results as possible side effect from long-term use of antipsychotic medications. Um, and again, of course, overuse, uh, you know, abusing the, the drugs is always a possibility. ECT and psychosurgery. Uh, ECT is still controversial despite it being improved significantly and not being as, uh, as wild as it once was. Um, it can lead to seizures or memory loss. And uh, 
but repetitive transcarnial magnetic stimulation, RTMS, may actually replace ECT in the future. Um, so just something kind of coming up on the horizon. Psychosurgery, lastly, is controversial with potentially serious or fatal side effects and complications. Again, because it's kind of a last resort. So just some, uh, some final stuff to go over with regard to therapy in general, so some essentials. So common goals of therapy. Therapy, in general, it's, it's all about attempts to change, to change something about a person, whether it's the way they behave, they think, they feel, or any number of things. Uh, so we look at disturbed thoughts. A therapist work to change faulty or destructive thoughts. They provide new ideas or information and guide individuals toward finding solutions to problems. Again, the, very important here that we guide the individuals toward finding them, finding the solutions. We don't tell people, there it is. We don't lift a rock and say, here's the answer to your problem, or give uh, straightforward advice. It's all about the person changing the way they think about the world and, and their uh, position in it. Disturbed emotions are also uh, sought for, for changing. Therapists help clients understand and control their emotions and relieve their emotional discomfort. Behaviors can be problematic as well. Uh, we help people eliminate troublesome behaviors and guide them toward more effective lives. That if the behaviors you are producing right now are not leading to an effective way of living as you've defined it, then we need to figure out new behaviors to put in their place. Uh, Interpersonal and life situation difficulties are also very common, uh, commonly addressed in therapy. This is when therapists help clients improve their relationships with others and avoid or minimize sources of stress in their lives. And lastly, the biomedical disturbances. The therapists will work to relieve biological disruptions that directly cause or contribute to psychological difficulties. For example, chemical imbalances that lead to depression. Again, this is, the biomedical piece is usually reserved for uh, uh, other professions like psychiatrists, uh, psychiatric nurse, physician, and whatnot. But still, as therapists, we still want to know what drugs the, the client is on and how that may be affecting the person. There's also a, an eclectic approach, something that's increasingly popular with people, that despite all the different styles of therapy as I described them, that it's not about a therapist saying, I will do this one or that one and nothing else at all. Um, there are plenty of therapists who do that, but uh, many are, are seeking more of an eclectic approach of saying, I like this piece over here and I like this piece over here. A lot of therapists nowadays borrow a great deal from Rogerian therapy. The idea of unconditional positive regard, of active listening, empathy, these are kind of major tenets of psychotherapy in general, regardless of your theoretical background. But again, they're, they're going to integrate that with perhaps Freudian or uh, uh, or kind of more like a Beck way of approaching therapy, because this all it's all about combining uh, techniques to form theories that that uh, to find the most appropriate treatment. That instead of trying to make a square peg fit in a round hole, let's see what we could do to that square peg to kind of like uh, to round it out, or to maybe kind of square off the, the the round hole. What can we do to try to make it fit for the person and and what they're presenting with? So here's a chart. I'm not going to go through all of it, but touch on some pieces because I think it's important. Uh, clinical psychologists, the, these are all the different kinds of medical, uh, or rather mental health professionals, I'm sorry. Uh, clinical psychologists possess either a PhD or a PsyD, a uh, Doctor of Philosophy or a Doctor of Psychology degree. Um, they, they seek training in hospitals, community mental health centers. They, all their training centers on the treatment of mental disorders, essentially, and, and, uh, and assessing for uh, psychological disorders. So um, they they essentially work in a world of of the mental disorder and trying to relieve the symptoms associated with that and uh, and improving life quality along the way. Um, they can be uh, they could also work in universities as teachers. They could be researchers and uh, they could have their own private practice. It's uh, they can essentially do anything. Their training lends themselves well to any number of uh, professions. Um, I myself have a PsyD and, uh, and I work as a professor right now. I've worked in the past as uh, a clinician during my training. So again, just to kind of highlight the, the variability with, uh, with what you could do with a clinical psychology doctorate. Um, and real quickly, just to highlight the difference between the two, PhD and PsyD. Uh, PhD has been around much longer. 
Uh, in the past, it's, it's historically been more focused on research than the practical use of psychology. And that's where the PsyD was kind of born out of, was uh, about 40 years ago. Uh, there was a meeting held by a psychologist and they said, you know, there are too many PhD programs that focus just on research. We're essentially training researchers and then sending them out into the field and saying, okay, now work with people. Just because you know how to, how to use um, uh, psychometric instruments and to uh, uh, conduct research and to develop, uh, you know, all, all these uh, uh, different hypotheses and, and testable hypotheses and whatnot, that, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good therapist, that you could see clients every, every day of every week and, and lead to successful treatment. So let's create a doctor of psychology degree and have that be the focus on uh, treatment of uh, mental disorders. That, uh, so that research is, kind of takes a back seat at, in terms of the training of people going through these programs, but instead we're going to give a much greater emphasis on the, the practical experience of this is what clients, this is what it's like to work with clients, this is what they present with, this is what you do with these clients, and, and here are all the different uh, assessment tools you can use, here are all the different techniques you can use. It's in theory uh, more driven towards the treatment of disorders than P. But again, just because that's the way that it was devised many years ago does not mean that that's the way it is today. So people who go through clinical psychology PhD programs have a much, uh, often have a much greater emphasis on the treatment of mental disorders and working with clients than people who went through PhD programs in clinical psychology in years past. Today, you'd be hard pressed to find much of a difference in terms of uh, how much time and emphasis is, is focused on the treatment of disorders between a PhD and a PsyD program. Uh, you, people will want to uh, you know, point to one as being better than the other. Having worked with plenty of people with PhDs and PsyDs, uh, I've yet to find, this is again just anecdotal, but I've yet to find any difference in, in terms of level of skill between uh, how a person with a PhD treats a client versus how somebody with a PsyD treats a client. Uh, that's it, by the time you're done with your program, you've gone through enough training, thousands of hours of, of training, uh, that it, it kind of offsets, I think, personally, at least, again, opinion, um, any difference between uh, the, the training, the, or rather the educational background. Um, so again, I, nowadays, it really seems to be pretty well balanced. In years past, there was a much stronger divide. That's kind of where the two degrees, why they split and where they came from. Counseling psychologists are similar to clinical psychologists, but they're, they usually have uh, a master's degree and focus a bit more on patient care, uh, client care, and um, and kind of life issues and, and uh, kind of adjusting to life's issues as opposed to diagnosable significant major like mental disorders. Psychiatrists are prescribing uh, medical professionals. They prescribe uh, um, uh, psychopharmacological treatments. Uh, psychiatric nurses are also able to, uh, often able to prescribe, but they still receive training and, and supervision from uh, uh, psychiatrists and physicians. Uh, psychiatric social workers normally have a master's degree in social work with uh, advanced training and experience in hospitals. And school psychologists usually begin with a bachelor's degree in psych and then go through graduate training in psych assessment and counseling involving school-related issues and problems. Usually they're going to work with kids with uh, 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 you know, learning disabilities, social skill issues, uh, f you know, family, family issues or, or uh, you know, bullying and, and whatnot. Um, all about kind of kids going through uh, something that may be uh, related to their academic performance. Again, there there are still some PsyDs, PhDs, EDs. I mean, there's plenty of people who go through school psychology programs that come out uh, practicing just as well with treatment as uh, somebody who goes through a clinical PsyD or clinical PhD program with an emphasis on kids. Um, so it's important to, to de decide if, if if any of you are thinking of going into psychology, and especially when it comes to treatment, uh, it's important to decide what feels best for you, and then I think sit comfortably with the fact that when you're done with whatever program you have, uh, you're going to be well trained in, in the, the treatment of, of clients if that's what you're seeking the program to, to train you in. Uh, regarding institution institutionalization, involuntary commitment can generally occur if people are believed to be of danger to themselves or others. 
uh, or in serious need of treatment if there's no reasonable less restrictive alternative. Uh, people will be essentially sent to a hospital and they have to stay there for 24, 48, 72 hours um, uh, against their will essentially if they are uh, believed to be in significant danger uh, to themselves or others or again. Deinstitutionalization though is the discharging of patients from mental hospitals as soon as possible and discouraging admissions. This is a, a major issue that came out again several decades ago with the closing of many state mental health hospitals uh, that due to due to poor funding um, that the the country essentially moved away from sending people with major psychological issues uh, to these um, uh, specific hospitals to for treatment and nowadays they're just sent to uh, oftentimes to just any kind of hospital with like a mental health unit or there may still in, in many cases there's still plenty of mental health hospitals at least in, in major urban areas um, in um, um, uh, in, in major countries. Uh, but again, with uh, this de idea of deinstitutionalization is to try to move away from putting people in the hospital at all uh, when it comes to mental health. So evaluating therapy in general, uh, we use controlled research and uh, meta-analyses, kind of looking at uh, meta-analysis meta is looking at the, the trends of, of several uh, journals, several pieces of research that have already um, been conducted. So essentially pulling like 20 articles that all look at some form of humanistic therapy and its efficacy, a meta-analysis will take a look at those 20 different studies and say, okay, now what's the trend? What can we definitively say is kind of the answer so far of does it work? And if so, to what degree? 40 to 80 percent of those who receive treatment are better off than those who not. Pretty wide range, but it's still pretty significant. And uh, short-term treatments can be as effective as long-term treatments. So treatments that are designed for kind of uh, four, six, or eight weeks of treatment, uh, those are considered short-term, will uh, have shown in research to be just as effective as uh, treatment that, goes, that, that lasts for years. A combination of therapy with medication is more effective than drugs alone. So again, we go back to the, uh, the myth earlier in the, in the lecture that just because I'm on drugs, I have psych drugs, and I'm all good, uh, that's simply not true because research has shown when you add therapy to it, it's way more effective in alleviating mental health disorders than just taking drugs. And some therapies are more effective for specific problems. Uh, you think of like aversion therapy or systematic uh, desensitization, that those are great for phobias or for um, uh, substance abuse issues. Very, very targeted for uh, for those issues and they don't work nearly as well for somebody who maybe uh, is having some um, shyness you know or, or in their job or at school or something um, systematic desensitization will only work for kind of a, a situational uh, piece of, uh, of of a trouble when it comes to finding therapy it's important to determine the level of need so if it's critical or urgent need uh, the person absolutely needs to seek hospital emergency services or call like a suicide hotline. Um, if there's any thought to hurting yourself or hurting somebody else, you absolutely need to seek the most urgent immediate care possible. If you have time to search though, ask around for referrals, talk to your friends, your uh, neighbors, your family members, anyone you know who has uh, who's struggled with that before and that you know has seek treatment and see if they have a good recommendation of someone to talk to. You could also go to your university or college counseling center. Uh, they'll often have people there to talk to you about issues, and if it requires a greater level of, of service than just a handful of appointments with them, then they will absolutely refer you out to somebody who can help you best. Um, ultimately, you want to seek a therapist who is best suited to your goals. That just because you walk into the door of somebody, that doesn't mean that they are the best therapist for you. You have to determine that yourself and find, the, find a therapist with whom you feel you have a great relationship with, that you can connect with them, uh, re that they can relate to you, and that you feel comfortable in their office, essentially, in, in working with them on your issues. Well, that's all for this You Read It Intro to Psychology course. Hope you found it to be informative, entertaining, interesting, and that it, uh, it met whatever needs that you had when you set out to, uh, to follow along with us on these lectures. Uh, so on behalf of Series of Accidents, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to learn about psychology. 
and I wish you the best in, in whatever you do in life with, uh, with psychology or without it.